to start with a video because it's very difficult to explain exactly what it is I do without showing you some visuals. Uh, in fact, every time I go across the border into the States, and the customs guy says, so what is it you do? And I, I've, I've come up with a glib response to that, which is that I build contraptions out of parts that don't yet exist. <laughs> and he looks at me and says, what do you really do? And I say, I build submarines. He says, go in that room over there. <laughs> so what I want to talk to you about is um, an idea, a thought that I had uh, a long time ago and I've been working towards for many years, but it involves the use of some rather interesting devices to go into the deep ocean. So let's roll the video and we'll see how it goes. Now, from Washington, D.C., and the headquarters of the National Geographic Society, this is National Geographic This Week. He saw a frontier and set out to conquer it. And to do that, Phil Newton designed and built machines that allowed people to do things no one had ever done before. Deep water diving suits, submarines, and mini submarines. It's a one-person submersible that can dive safely to 2,000 feet. There's some, something so incredibly gratifying when the water closes over your head, you know, you sort of go, yeah, I'm still alive, it worked. You know, everything that I just built worked. Newton is an inventor, adventurer, and pioneer, devoted to deep water diving. For more than 40 years, Newton has called the sea his second home. In 1985, his company, Newtco Research, patented the Newt Suit, a one-atmosphere hard-shell suit that allows the diver to reach depths of a thousand feet. Often called a submarine you wear, the suit protects its occupant from crushing external pressure. This is a universe of ancient, mysterious creatures. We're newcomers, led by a handful of visionaries. One of them is Phil Newton. Newton's personal loss sparked a lifelong mission to find a way to visit the ocean's depths and come back safe. You have to remember that the enemy is the pressure, not the cold, not the darkness, not the wetness, not our inability to breathe water. The pressure is the enemy. In 1934, a courageous American scientist, William Beebe, and inventor, Otis Barton, attempt to make the world's deepest dive in an experimental device called a bathysphere. During an unmanned test, a quartz window cracks at depth, filling the bathysphere with water at tremendous pressure. When he opens the hatch, Beebe confronts the power that kills in a heartbeat. The Newt Suit's one of the great Canadian inventions of the late 20th century. Developed by Phil Newton in North Vancouver between 1979 and 1987, the suit is an amazing piece of technology. It's literally a submersible that you wear. Like a, a suit of armor, it keeps the ocean out. You're at one atmosphere, the same pressure that you and I breathe today on the surface, which means you can go deep, work, and then come up without having any of the problems of the bends. There are certain jobs that um, atmospheric diving suits are, are best suited for over an ROV. An ROV still has relatively clumsy manipulators. You, you'll see servo feedback arms and all kinds of fancy arms. Well, an atmospheric diving suit like the WASP or the nude suits, they have a certain advantage with the uh, human being in a one atmosphere housing and their hands actually on the articulated claws because the user can feel through the claws when he's touching something they can actually grab and get a sense of pressure and feedback after they've gotten used to using the claw. And they can take fittings apart and all so do all sorts of things you could never do in a million years with a, with a current ROV. I, 
I think we're fortunate to be in the sort of generation that's the first ones to see this planet from space and to understand that this planet should not have been called Earth. It should have been called water because it truly is a water planet. And I kind of, in my poetic moments, I like to think of myself as, as forging passports to allow us to, to visit the three quarters of this planet that we were denied access to by birth. And so that's what building this equipment is all about. And that's what understanding the undersea world is all about. Is the, I, I really believe that we're the early explorers, the first wave that we're moving into this part of our planet. Phil Newton envisions devices that will help him construct a self-sustaining station deep under the sea. I uh, am very interested and have been doing a lot of sketches and a lot of thinking about an undersea colony operating one atmosphere in deep water. So a very grandiose, ambitious scheme, yes, doable, absolutely, absolutely doable. And it's going to be done. If not me, someone's going to do it. Here we are doing the sketching of the event base alpha. And um, the idea is to build this colony under the sea. Um, I built a lot of underwater hardware before, saturation diving, diving bells, that sort of stuff. And essentially, what I propose to build, and you see here, yeah, you see Captain Kirk is involved also. <laughs> you wonder what happened to him. Uh, so this is a black smoker. Many of you have seen this on television. The, uh, these black volcano-like things that are at the bottom of the sea and the black smoke that comes out, they're called thermal vents. And um, the temperature of this vent that you see here where that black smoke is and here in, uh, in real time um, is about 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That means that if you were to take a metal such as a gold ring and drop it into a, a, a glass of that 1,000 degree water, it would dissolve, not melt, but actually dissolve right down to its bare constituents. But the problem is that uh, you can't have 1,000 degree water in a glass because, of course, at 212, it's gone. But your car, for instance, has water at 400 odd degrees and it doesn't go anywhere, and that's because it's under pressure. So in the deep ocean, where you, the deep ocean that you see here, and um, the, where the heat vents exist, um, the fluid that comes out of them is actually dissolved minerals. What you're seeing here is uh, what's gonna feed the colony, because there is an enormous um, amount of life surrounding the heat vents. These, uh, these shrimps, or these albino prawns, and clams, and crabs, and this sort of stuff, all these crustaceans live from the, uh, the thermal vent. So this thermal vent uh, idea, here's the guy in, in Little Collie saying, oh God, not shrimp salad again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of pretty down there where it's very deep. Uh, you'd expect that it would be kind of uh, just mud and, and that sort of stuff. So quickly, the idea is to construct this colony. Now remember the, the, the important words are one atmosphere. We um, are, we're born, evolved, we're left, left by aliens, take your pick, whatever your flavor is, um, here a swilling years ago. And we are sort of captive around sea level. We can't go, um, for instance, to the top of Mount Everest uh, the way we were born without clothing, without uh, different uh, oxygen mixtures, etc., We certainly can't go to the bottom of the ocean. We are stuck here at sort of at sea level with the right temperature, the right pressure, the right breathing gases. As soon as we attempt to go away from that, we get into all kinds of problems. But we, well, we don't run down the runways, for instance, in Vancouver Airport flapping our arms and expecting to leap into the air but, because we can't fly. But we can fly. We can fly. We go from here to London, from here to New York. We jump in an aircraft. We go into this contraption, this capsule, and we do fly. So we can't fly, we say, but in fact, we've been to the moon, and we're going to Mars, and we're going to various asteroids because we're using the armor of technology to take us outside of our earthbound limitations of, the, of where we are, our design specifications, if you will. So that's what this whole idea of using technology to get to the bottom of the ocean is take it with you. Same as in an aircraft. When you get into the aircraft, the uh, pressure is the pressure you're used to, the breathing gas, the ventilation, everything is what you're used to or what you need. 
And that's what we propose for this colony and for the subs that, uh, that my company, Nuco, has built in the past. The armored diving suits, originally called the Newt suit, now the latest version called the exosuit. This allows you to go down where the outside pressure is absolutely enormous. So at the depths of 1,000 feet, the pressure is 500 pounds per square inch. And um, the suit has to be absolutely rigid in order to withstand that pressure. But at the same time, you have to be able to work, to move, to walk, to swim. So it seems like a paradox, but we've found a way around that and uh, now are able to do that. We're able to make a suit that goes down that deep and still maintains its full flexibility. So what to do down there in this colony? We're going to sit around and play cards and eat shrimp salad? No. What we're going to do is take this, um, this dissolved metals that come up in that black cloud and uh, use them to uh, descend to the surface, and that will be the uh, economically viable base of the colony is the, uh, these metals that are sent to the surface. Some of them, for instance, here uh, in Juan de Fuca Strait, a uh, common one is cobalt, um, and that's a semi-precious metal. It's so very, very hard to get and very rare. So uh, we use suits like the uh, minute suit or the exosuit to go out and work. Uh, we use, to transport us around, we use things like, uh, like the deep workers, the little subs you saw. And all of this is built around the heat vents because we have it powered by what's called a Stirling cycle engine. And that is an engine that runs on the differential between the hot and cold. You need about 300 degrees Fahrenheit differential in order to operate this machine. We have five times that with these heat vents. So here you have this enormous machine generating thousands of horsepower uh, because the vent bases are not just one vent, they're a whole field. And um, that thousands of horsepower will turn generators, which allow you then to have an artificial sun um, it uh, will allow you to grow crops in that artificial sun if you wish. And so it's kind of interesting to think of what might be down there. Now in the deep ocean, uh, I don't know if, if many of you here have been down to two or 3,000 feet, but uh, <laughs> if you are, you'll agree. Most of the life is in the water column, not on the bottom. So when you get down past 1,000 feet or so in one of our little subs or in the suits, um, what you're seeing uh, is this sort of a giant clam chowder almost of, of critters. And of course, it's very dark down there. You have artificial lighting on your, on your vehicle, but all around you, it's pitch black. And all of these critters are communicating with each other by bioluminescence. So all this is like a, a 1970s psychedelic show down there. It's, everything's flashing and going. It's, it's really incredible to see. And critters that you never even imagined, uh, for instance, uh, one of the best known underwater conservationists is a, uh, a woman by the name of Dr. Sylvia Earle. And we taught her to, uh, to fly our subs or to pilot our subs. And the problem with her was every time we'd get her in the water, we had a hell of a time getting her back out because she was seeing brand new stuff all the time, critters that no one else even knew existed. She's shooting high def uh, video of these things. And she uh, found uh, not too long ago a midwater octopus, a huge thing, not a squid, but an octopus that lives in, mid, in the midwater and never touches the seafloor. So there's all this incredible stuff going on midwater. We don't take advantage of that at all. Now, you've often heard that 75% of the planet is covered by the ocean. That's not exactly true. It's more like um, 79%. So here we are, 80% of this planet, we have no access to the way we were born. But we're going to need it pretty soon because the way the, uh, the land is getting used up by uh, the population growth um, and everything else. Scientists say we came from the sea. It's very possible that one day we may go back. But when you think about this 80% of the world, of our planet, that's under the sea, think about this. We, uh, it's not just the seafloor that we're talking about. It's that enormous water column. The deep ocean is seven miles deep. Imagine that, 35,500 feet deep, as, as tall as Mount Everest is high. And in that water column, you could construct all sorts of buildings and everything else that don't necessarily have to be on the bottom. They can be mid-water. So it's, if you want to think ambitiously and very far ahead, just think that uh, some, someday, way a long time from now, um, there may be colonies under the sea 
that are held to the seafloor by cables and are floating. We can't do that on land. Wouldn't it be great if you could build a skyscraper or these, particularly the apartments and whatnot you see being built on the North Shore these days. God, they're putting them up everywhere. But if you didn't have to sit them on the ground, if they, if they were uh, like a helium balloon that you could just sub simply suspend them on some uh, high tension fibers, uh, what a boon that would be. But then, of course, you know, if you stepped out of your balcony, you'd fall onto the earth. <laughs> but that doesn't happen underwater. Remember, underwater, the water is dense enough that when you step off your balcony, you can fly. And uh, in the suits that we build now, they have a jet pack on them, so you actually can fly underwater. And I can tell you this from the bottom of my heart. If you ever have a chance to get a submarine, by all means, get one. We need the money, plus you need the experience. <laughs> So uh, it really is quite a, uh, an amazing thing to go down. Now there are um, a, no, a number of, uh, sub of these uh, tourist subs that are in use all over the world. I mean, in uh, Hawaii, for instance, in Italy, in, in the Mediterranean, various parts of the Mediterranean. The company that developed the first tourist subs is in Richmond. It's called uh, Atlantis Submarines. Most of the, of the atmosphere, in fact, all of the atmospheric diving suits in use around the world today by navies and by commercial companies were developed here on the North Shore. Um, the submarines that we build now, we're standing on the shoulders of a group that started the North Shore 35 years ago called International Hydrodynamics, HICO. They built the Pisces submarines. So, so much has happened here on the North Shore and so few people um, that live in Vancouver or the Metro uh, are even aware that this sort of thing is going on. In the deep sea community around the world, everybody is, knows that Vancouver, well, actually Canada, and then more specifically British Columbia, and even more specifically um, Vancouver, and even closer than that, the North Shore, is a hotbed of uh, cutting edge technology. We build equipment now and do research for the US Navy, for NOAA, the National uh, um, Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, and very specifically for, for NASA. Now you'd think that by, by the very nature, by definition, the bottom of the ocean and outer space must be as far apart as they can possibly be. And yet the fact is that the, the commonality of the equipment we use and the problems that we face are almost identical. Uh, we're working right now training, we've trained uh, 32 astronauts, both uh, American and Canadian, to fly in our subs and to use the suits for their zero gravity training. And what we're working on right now is uh, taking, using our subs, our small subs, as, uh, as lander simulators. And they are planned to land, NASA plans to land on three different asteroids uh, over the, in the next 20 years and uh, actually build a, a, jet threat, a, a jet thruster to be able to push these, uh, these particular beasts out of their orbit because there is a chance over the next 30 to 40 years that they may um, prove to be a problem to Earth. So, so what a great and interesting way to make a living to do the stuff we're doing. I go to work every day with a big smile on my face. And my time is up, but I will say this. I was very interested in, um, in, to in Todd's talk this morning where he asked the question, very specific question, can technology save us? My answer to that is, it's the only thing that can. Thank you very much. Yeah.